Okay, well, by my clock, it is uh, 2 o'clock Eastern, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Mann, and I am an assistant professor at Michigan State University, and I also host the series Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development, which is sponsored by the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. So I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, it's, the title is Optimize Nitrogen Fertilizer Placement with Fertisaver N. So before we get started with the presentation, I want to point out a few items. So quickly, uh, if you have not done so, uh, please take just a moment and answer the poll questions. Your feedback is helpful for our research and our extension efforts. And at the uh, conclusion of the presentation, you'll have an opportunity to, to revisit this and we'll have a, a couple more questions for you. So your, uh, again, your uh, participation is uh, helpful. So in the chat box below, I have included mine and Kostub's email. So I also included my LinkedIn information. So I like to uh, keep track of my network uh, through LinkedIn. And so if you haven't connected with me already um, and you have the opportunity to do so, I would uh, much appreciate that. Um, also is our uh, YouTube page. So the Innovations in Agriculture YouTube page. Um, with that, we are uh, recording the presentation and uh, that also will include the question and answer se uh, session. So if you'd like access to this recording, you can visit our Innovations in Agriculture YouTube page, and I should have this posted later today or by first thing tomorrow. So finally, uh, the presentation itself is going to be about 20 to 25 minutes, and we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. So as your questions come up, please uh, enter those into the chat box below, and we will get to your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. So I want to thank everybody for participating today. Um, so our presenter is uh, Dr. Kostub Baylero, um, and he is an associate professor in the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering at the University of Illinois in Champaign, uh, Urbana-Champaign. So he's also the founder and CEO of Soil Diagnostics Incorporated. So today in our presentation, Kostub is going to share some of the details about his efforts to develop and commercialize uh, the new innovation, um, Fertisaver N. So with that, Kostub, uh, take it away. Great. Uh, so my name is Kostub Bhalerao. I'm an associate professor, as John mentioned, and my interests are in uh, bioinstrumentation, biotechnology, and bioinformatics. Uh, I want to share a little bit about the journey of soil diagnostics, how we got started. So um, uh, several years ago, uh, about 2011, uh, a colleague of mine and, uh, and myself, we were talking about how to detect the soybean cyst nematode in the field. So uh, you might be familiar with soybean cyst nematode. This is the largest pathogen of uh, grain crops in the U.S. Um, causes about a, a $1 billion worth of damage in the Midwest alone. And uh, while we were talking about that, we realized that there was a need to, uh, the current state of the art for uh, characterizing a field for soybean cyst nematode infections was essentially a manual soil sampling and analysis process. And uh, as, a, as an engineer, um, this uh, sounded very, uh, uh, you know, in, in 2012, it sounded very uh, inappropriate that the people should still be using uh, sieves and, uh, you know, hoses and things like that to, to uh, process soil samples. So we started thinking about how we could develop a robot to automate the manual labor in, uh, in uh, extracting soybean cyst nematode eggs from soil samples. Um, if there, if uh, in, in the audience, if there's someone who has done work on the soybean cyst nematode, you understand the kind of pain that uh, my colleague was expressing when he said that this was a truly painful process. Um, so we conceived of some ideas uh, and we got an early grant to uh, start developing some of these robotics and thus was born soil diagnostics. So um, soil diagnostics started with a vision to uh, reach, to allow corn and soybean growers to reach their full profit potential through soil management, through soil based disease and nutrient management. And, uh, uh, as an engineer in, in the premier ag and biological engineering institution, um, it became part of my program mission to develop the best diagnostic tools that corn and soybean growers can use in order to monitor and optimize the health of their soil. 
So soil is the grower's key asset. Uh, soil is more actionable than weather. Uh, many of the products today in the big data trend in agriculture are focused on weather. Uh, very few of them are actually focused on soil. However, soil is something that the farmer can control. Um, and soil has nutrients and pathogens that can be diagnosed and monitored. So just like the advances that we have seen in the medical sector, where diagnosis of uh, blood lipids, for instance, uh, provide actionable information uh, towards the health of a person, in the same way, diagnosing pathogens and nutrients in the soil can provide very actionable information to uh, the farmer. Uh, and we also discovered along the way that farmers trust their agronomists far more uh, sadly than they trust university extension these days, but that's the truth. Uh, farmers trust agronomists. And so having that agronomist in the loop became a key uh, driving principle behind soil diagnostics. So what does soil diagnostics do? What do we produce? Uh, we have a, a nice product pipeline at this point. Uh, we have the Fertisaver N test for which the beta program is now open and I will talk about that in more detail today. Uh, I briefly mentioned the soybean cyst nematode extractor. Uh, you can find a video of that on YouTube and you can ask questions later on about that, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, in, in uh, very much detail, uh, except that that also is a second product that we are working on right now. Now, the neat thing that we have done with soil diagnostics is that we have integrated all of this with uh, the, the power of the World Wide Web. All of our testing equipment connects to a computer via standard USB cable and all of the data handling and processing and uh, report generation happens over the web. Uh, so that web program is called the Soil DX dashboard and it's, it's also available right now. Uh, in development, we have some virulence tests and uh, something we, we're calling right now the Soil Health Index, uh, which is an overall marker of, of uh, soil health. Uh, that we are trying to develop right now. So uh, I'm just going to talk about the Fertisaver N today. So Fertisaver N is a soil test to optimize nitrogen fertilizer usage. As you're well aware, um, nitrogen is one of the largest input costs. Nitrogen on corn costs about between $75 and $100 per acre. And excess nitrogen is economically inefficient and ecologically harmful. Uh, over here, I'm showing an image of the uh, hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is caused uh, fairly directly because of overapplication of nitrogen in the Midwest here. Now, the Fertisaver N test uh, had a uh, ha has a predecessor test, and that test has been used by a very very small number of farmers. And uh, their agronomists report that farmers who use that particular test to determine their nitrogen needs save approximately $35 per acre. However, that test is extremely slow and cumbersome to implement. So these agronomists uh, about a year and a half ago came to us and said that, that please help us improve the throughput of our test. This was directly because of uh, them having seen our soybean cyst nematode robot in action and they said, well, can you help us solve this particular problem? So last year we uh, took, took on the challenge of uh, taking this lab test and turning it into a high throughput test. And uh, what we have today is the Fertisaver N as a result. Uh, so I'm, I should reiterate here that the demand for this test came from the agronomists themselves. We knew about the test, we knew about its uh, value, but the, the agronomists who were using this uh, and, if, and, and they could not keep up with the demand that their farmers were coming to them with. And uh, this is really why we um, uh, focused uh, very extensively on developing this particular technology. So just how big is the problem? Uh, 96 million acres of corn were planted in the US this year, according to USDA statistics. And uh, the segment that we are addressing with our product, with our technology, is those farms that are more than a thousand acres. And there's 25 million acres in farms like that. Now, why this size? And the reason is that the results of our uh, test um, typically feed nicely into the variable rate 
technologies out there, the variable rate application technologies out there. And uh, typically, larger farmers tend to have more investments in those kinds of technologies, and therefore, we're targeting those farmers. Larger farmers also tend to uh, use the services of crop consultants to a larger extent than farmers who are farming less than a thousand acres. Our initial target to approach in the next couple of years is the 8 million acres in Illinois and Iowa that are greater than a thousand acres. Uh, how are we going to approach them? We are working with networks of agronomists. Um, we hope to reach about 500 independent agronomists who are providing such advice to large farmers. Currently, we have six committed customers, and our reach right now is about 1 million acres. Let me get that arrow point off. Um, we expect that the revenue potential for something like this could be close to $2 per acre per year. Uh, and we hope to reach about 8 million acres by the year 2022. So how does this soil test-based test nitrogen recommendation work right now? So I have a swim lane diagram uh, right here. Here, this is the farmer. Typically what happens is that the farmer requests a nitrogen program. They, they call up their agronomist and say, hey, I need a nitrogen recommendation. Uh, the, the agronomist will send out their soil samplers, collect the soil samples, and send all those samples to the soil tester. The soil tester processes those tests, delivers those results, and the agronomist then prepares a prescription based on those test results and optionally can directly send the prescription to the fertilizer dealer who then sells the fertilizer and fulfills that prescription on the farmer's field. Now, um, what many farmers are doing today is the following. If uh, they are actually directly requesting the nitrogen recommendation from their dealer, and this constitutes a, uh, a conflict of interest to some extent, the dealer goes straight to step eight and sells the farmer the fertilizer. So, if the agronomist is not in the loop, then the farmer is essentially beholden to what the dealer recommends, and usually the dealer is going to use something like uh, the extension handbook to make a uh, recommendation. Um, or alternatively, they're going to make a yield-based recommendation. They're going to say, what was your uh, yield last year? What's your yield goal for this year? And uh, they calculate the nitrogen recommendation based on those yields. Now, what FertiSaver N does is it actually automates this gray block here. So the requests of the soil tests and the processing of the soil test, as well as preparing the prescription, is automated through our system. Uh, and usually that ends up actually reducing the uh, nitrogen uh, prescription rates substantially in the fertile soils in the Midwest, specifically in Illinois and Iowa. Um, what that means is that the dealer um, usually ends up selling approximately $35 less uh, per acre, and the farmer ends up saving $25 because uh, about $10 is now competed as part of the prescription that the agronomist generates. So um, we have several agronomists that we have spoken to, and this is where those numbers come from. This is what our hardware looks like. So it's an extremely uh, simple looking set of equipment. On the left hand side here, we have the filling station. That's a weighing scale, and that's a RFID tracking uh, pad. Uh, we have custom designed these, these jars here. Uh, each of these jars holds a sample. Each of these jars are RFID tagged. Uh, in, uh, on, uh, when the sample is collected, you assemble the sample by assembling all the reagents and the uh, disposable pieces in the cup. Uh, you, you close the cup and you let it incubate for 24 hours. The following day you come in, you open the jar, place it inside this reader here, close the lid and the computer does the rest. So it, it, the computer is automatically capturing uh, the sample barcodes, um, the sample tracking IDs, the uh, RFID tra tags on the jar, the data coming from the sensor, and collating all of this in a central database. So our hardware is validated, procedures optimized. Uh, we actually have a fully working website right now. We have a provisional patent filed. Uh, and the test is actually available to uh, clients right now. We are waiting on production of these jars, uh, but but otherwise we are we're 
uh, were there. Um, the value is all the way up and down the chain. So for the soil testing lab, this test allows them to process 10 times as many samples, uh, up to 1500 samples per day with one uh, technician. Uh, and it allows the, the soil tests, uh, so the soil testing labs to actually reach uh, much, much higher throughputs than what were currently available with the existing technology. The agronomists, because the whole process is automated and the prescriptions are generated on the web directly, it allows agronomists to increase their reach as well. And uh, because we are using uh, the web technologies and the RFID tracking technologies, a lot of the labor saving, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, we, we're eliminating a lot of the clerical errors occurring from just writing down labels and things like that. Uh, we have much reduced operator errors and uh, we have built this on a complete end-to-end -end encryption system so that only you and your agronomist uh, can see the data and 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 really we, we have all of those safeguards in place so that the farmer and the agronomist's trust is maintained in a, in a careful manner. We're, we're very careful about uh, data privacy and very sensitive to those issues. The second problem that the, this product solves is not, uh, the first one of course is the speed of the test. We can make this test 10 times faster. But the second problem it solves is a uh, is a state-of-the-art machine learning engine. So once a test reading is uh, generated from the system, that reading cannot be uh, naively interpreted. There's not a simple formula that says if your number is X, your fertilizer rates should be Y. That number has to be interpreted in the context of soil samples, where the sample came from, what was the management practice, what was the previous, uh, uh, what were previous application rates, what were previous yields, uh, was there a manuring history. So this is what we have encapsulated in a very simple uh, algorithm straight off the web uh, called the FertiSaver Action Plan. When you place your soil sample uh, on a map indicating where that sample came from and you provide a few pieces of management information about tillage practices and previous crops and so on, the system generates something called the action plan. The action plan is a complete year prescription. Um, so it tells us, so, so ideally the test is done in fall right after harvesting the, the last crop. Um, Right after that, the, the action plan is going to recommend whether any amount of nitrogen is required for residue decomposition, typically in corn on corn rotations, what kind of pH and soil texture improvements need to be made by adding lime, what kind of pre-plant nitrogen recommendations uh, are, are made for the following spring, and then depending upon how the weather evolves over the spring, we will also change the side dress recommendations. So this side dress recommendation will come from hydrological models. Uh, we have not implemented this yet, but this is happening over the next year. Uh, so again, this is a state of the art recommendation system. Uh, it's fully automated so that with one button push, the agronomist can generate recommendations for uh, uh, that are compatible with, with uh, VRT equipment. You can directly upload that, this recommendation in your sprayer and off you go. Our beta program for this product is currently open. Right now it is available only to those uh, soil labs who have had a history of providing this kind of a recommendation service um, because our, our training costs to them are lower. We don't need to go out and tell them how to use the test effectively while our uh, calibration model is still getting validated. So the purpose of the beta program is to test the hardware and the software. Uh, we have about six labs that have uh, provided us with um, soft commitments. Two of them have actually signed paperwork. Uh, we haven't uh, we haven't asked for their checks yet because we're still waiting on our jars. Uh, but they're paying a fee of about five thousand dollars to cover the hardware and the software license for one year. Let's talk a little bit about competition. Many of you have probably heard of the nitrate testing. This is this nitrogen testing is not the in-season nitrate testing that is typically conducted. Um, the big difference is that the nitrate tests, nit the nitrate molecule is extremely susceptible to leaching and runoff. And uh, the results of the nitrate test 
are only valid for the next 48 hours if you have had no rains or things like that in the intervening time. So the nitrate test is logistically extremely challenging to pull off. You have to get the sample, process the sample, and produce the prescription within a couple days, within three or four days, uh, in order for your citrus applications. Um, so this test is not the nitrate test. It's actually uh, a measure of the organic nitrogen in the soil that becomes available over the entire growing season. And this is done in the fall, right after the previous harvest. Um, also, our throughput is about 10 times for the nitrate test right now. Uh, a similar test that measures the uh, is, it, that measures the organic nitrogen is the Solvita SLAN test, which is the soil labile amino uh, amino nitrogen, I believe, is the full form. Um, but that test is also uh, a, a very low throughput. Um, they don't, as far as I know, they do not provide any kind of a recommendation system that is compatible with VRT type applications. Uh, and it's actually a much more expensive test compared to what we can offer ours for. Uh, they haven't provided much benefit to the grower. Uh, we have data that actually shows that the benefit can be quantified and it's about $35 in Illinois and Iowa. Uh, biggest challenge compared to, um, the biggest challenge for the Solvita is that it's a do-it-yourself kind of a test. Uh, some labs will offer it, but they're not making any recommendations based on the results of the test. Uh, there's another class of computation that exists, and that is uh, the computational tools. So for example, um, uh, Monsanto has a, uh, the Climate Pro product, or Pioneer has Encirca, or Adapten from uh, good folks at Cornell. And th these computational tools uh, have a lot of merit. What they're doing is, um, based on soil results, they're estimating the hydrological and the mineralization potential of the soil. Uh, their throughput is essentially infinity. There's no test component to it. It's, it's mainly uh, data that has been uh, modeled, and it's essentially equations that are converting that into how much nitrogen is likely to become available. Um, most tools, they have variability in their uh, utility. So some tools are better than others. Um, they do have real-time action ability, so these tools will pick up on uh, rain events and, and recommend uh, or, or at least mention that or indicate that there might have been nitrogen losses because of unseasonal rains or something like that. Um, the costs also vary, and uh, some of the better tools actually have some documentation on um, the savings that can be effected. However, much of this depends upon the farmer or their agronomist providing good enough data for the model to run. So uh, com com computer models are all garbage in, garbage out. If the data going in is not good, the recommendations coming out are not going to be good. Biggest competition for us is actually the status quo, the do-nothing scenario. There's no cost. There's no throughput issues. Uh, there's, there's no planning as such. But um, if, if growers just choose to go by uh, extension recommendations like the maximum return to nitrogen rate, um, then they're, they're not losing any. There's no additional cost to what they're doing, but they're not saving any money either. They're, they're, they may be losing, leaving money on the table. So we believe that that particular approach right now uh, leads to lower profitability. So um, in summary, the Fertisever N has a high throughput. We have the action tool, action plan tool that provides rec detailed recommendations on what you should do. Uh, with our strategic partners, which I'll mention in a second, we will actually be able to provide some of the hydrological modeling benefits that the computational tools will also provide. Um, the cost to the grower is roughly about $10. Uh, we are not di direct directly selling this test to the grower. We are selling it to the agronomist who is then buying the hardware or the soil, uh, soil testing labs are then buying the hardware in conjunction with their agronomist. Um, we believe we can save about $35 in Illinois and Iowa. And our biggest challenge right now is market penetration. Soil testing and indeed all agriculture works on an annual cycle. Um, we can't make uh, sales calls or marketing phone calls at any given point. We have to hit a certain season before farmers and agronomists and soil labs have enough time to look at this. And it's a multi-sided sale. Uh, while the ultimate beneficiary is the farmer, our sale has to be made first to the agronomist and then to the soil testing lab. 
So um, let me talk re really briefly about the SCN extractor. I mentioned that this was actually our first product. So this is a robot that can rapidly uh, help in assessing the, the, the uh, level of uh, soybean cyst nematode pathogens in the soil. Um, the robot works. Uh, we can actually achieve a throughput of about one sample per minute uh, with this test compared to about uh, four samples per hour. That's typical for manual processing. Um, right now, this technology is under consideration for a license uh, with a seed company, and we're, we have our fingers crossed to see how that goes for now. Um, the SCN extractor solves uh, a problem of soybean. So the previous one was for corn, this one's for soybean. Um, it tries to address the soybean cyst nematode problem. We believe that growers can make money uh, in, a, in the face of SCN by using high yielding but susceptible varieties where they don't have a problem. SCN problems tend to be regionally limited. In a field, you might have a couple hot spots that seem to have SCN issues, uh, and they're not really widely or uniformly distributed like other in like insect problems might be. So we believe that a farmer can actually make about $21 per acre if they do the right thing. Um, of course, SCN is now endemic to all soy soybean growing regions uh, of the US, and we believe it's gonna become a bigger and bigger problem as time goes by. So how does uh, soil diagnostics, what's the business model for soil diagnostics? So as I mentioned before, soil diagnostics does not directly sell to the farmer. However, we do go out and uh, uh, present our, our technologies, tools, and, and showcase the simplicity and the usefulness of the tool to growers. Uh, our primary clients are really the agronomists. So agronomists, um, they work with, in conjunction with soil testing labs, if they convince the soil testing lab that the product that they can sell these kinds of tests, then the soil testing labs generally don't have uh, much of a barrier uh, in, in acquiring our instrument and running these tests for them because the tests themselves run very much, uh, they're very compatible with the uh, workflow that a typical soil testing lab has. So um, the agronomists purchase and set up the hardware. That's a one-time expense for them, or we can structure that as a monthly payment, both for SCN extractor as well as the fertilizer N. And then they pay an annual license fee um, for the SoilDX dashboard. This is the web-based tool on which uh, the entire equipment and the data is housed. Um, and they pay a per test fee on every single test. So since our devices are connected directly to the web, we have the ability to measure every single test as it is done uh, in real time. And, they, uh, and we can build them according to that. So we, we think this model is preferred because soil testing is a seasonal business. Um, soil testing labs don't want to be paying um, if they are not using the equipment. And so this is something that they tend to prefer. Um, additional re recurring revenues can be generated um, by creating reports, recommendations, and uh, other kinds of features, like for instance, taking a recommendation and then uploading it directly to your applicator. That's the kind of technologies that we will be developing over the next couple of years. Um, last year, we received a phase one National Science Foundation SBIR award, and we were fortunate enough to be able to hire a, an, uh, an excellent team uh, so our team consists of Dr. Saeed Khan. So he's one of the primary inventors on the predecessor to the Fertisaver N test. He's a soil chemist and a soil biochemist. Uh, Dr. Chinmay Soman is an environmental microbiologist and a data scientist. Uh, the, the problem of making nitrogen available uh, from the organic matter is a microbial ecology problem. And uh, we bring together uh, Chinmay's expertise in microbial ecology to understand how this process occurs over the growing season. Um, ben Thompson, he's a Purple Heart uh, recipient. He's a Marine, um, he, and he's come back to school after his service. He's uh, our automation and hardware uh, development guy, and he uh, um, builds a lot of the tools that we are building. Uh, my own role is uh, developing the web, uh, the website, uh, the web application part of the technology, as well as the uh, uh, the, the aspects about automating uh, some of this technology, as well as uh, I've been learning a lot more about the business aspects 
about uh, agriculture and soil testing in particular over the last year. We have some uh, very valuable strategic partnerships. We are um, working with Agribull. This is a local uh, leading company that's providing decision support tools for farmers. Uh, one of their products is the Advanced Nutrient Engine. This is a computational model that can estimate runoff of nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and that model we will be integrating into our own recommendation plan. This is the model that will help us estimate uh, nitrogen losses due to uh, pre-season rains uh, that then allow us to correct for those things in a side dress application. Um, we have been also talking to uh, 360 Yield Center. This is a premier developer of fertilizer application equipment. Um, they have a complementary product, the nitrate testing product, uh, but uh, our tool is actually very valuable to them in terms of being able to help them um, make a case for their uh, uh, precision applicators like the wide drop technology that they're developing. Um, and, and we are also working with the leading crop consultant who extensively uses this particular test, the soil nitrogen test, in making uh, his recommendations. So that's the crop tech consulting. Uh, we've got a slew of uh, advisors. Uh, Dr. Richard Mulvaney is a professor at the University of Illinois, and he's actually a primary developer. Um, Drs. Lambert and Tilka are nematologists, and they've been helping us with the SCN pro uh, project. Uh, and we've got business and agriculture advisors as well. Briefly on the financial projections, uh, we developed this for our phase two. Um, we're, we're expecting a phase two award coming in this Thanksgiving starting uh, next year, so starting January 1. Uh, and we expect by the end of phase two, we will be at a revenue potential of about $1.5 million. Um, the, the jaggedy spikes that you can see in this uh, uh, table here are primarily because soil testing is a seasonal activity. And so we expect to accrue revenue in the soil testing seasons and then burn through that revenue during the rest of the season. Um, our commercialization and funding strategy uh, thus far, uh, we've received about about $100,000 over 2013 and 2014 prototyping the SCN extractor, um, building the proof of concept. Uh, University of Illinois provided us with a business development grant of about um, $11,000 total to start the company and um, hire lawyers and do all of that paperwork. Uh, and then last year, uh, we won a National Science Foundation Phase 1 SPIR award, which was about $150,000. Um, the Fertisaver and Beta program is expected to generate some revenue, and uh, we expect that the SN extractor, um, if, we, if we can work out the details, will also generate some licensing revenue over the next year. So uh, I had this slide up here because uh, I, I wanted it's partly to show what we what we want to do over the next uh, few years. Of course, we have a slew of technical development tasks ahead of us that will be covered hopefully by the NSF Phase Two, SBR Phase Two. Uh, but the Phase Two does not cover um, business expenses, so it does not cover uh, marketing expenses. It doesn't cover um, sales. So we are uh, in the process of. Um, raising about $150,000 right now to hire some sales associates and develop marketing materials. So you call that the soil testing business is a multi-way sale. We have to sell to the farmer, sell to the agronomist, and sell to the soil lab um, in three different ways. And so we need to make sure that we can help each of these stakeholders communicate with each other in an effective way. And we're uh, making sure that we uh, help them with that with uh, marketing and, and um, uh, technical literature. Um, so this is kind of where we are right now, and uh, that, that was my last slide. So again, my last slide here, this is my, uh, I'm Kaustu Bhalera again, uh, founder and CEO of Soil Diagnostics, and uh, my preferred email address is actually the one you see on the screen. I will type it up again um, in, the, in the chat bar here. Um, so I'm an associate professor at University of Illinois as well, but uh, I tend to leave all my soil diagnostics related questions on this particular email. So with that, I'm happy to take questions.
Okay, well, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just changed the screen. So as you have, uh, as your questions are coming up, uh, please uh, go ahead and enter those into the uh, chat box. And I've got a, I've got a couple questions for you myself. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off, uh, Kostov, and just ask you uh, really quickly, uh, given the makeup of the audience, uh, what sort of feedback would be really helpful for you uh, from agronomists working with uh, producers in the field? Um, what would be beneficial is, of course, uh, if you indicate, if, if you're aware of something like this, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, this test has been used on a very, very small scale. It has, people have found it difficult to use the test. Uh, so if you are familiar with something like this, that would be useful from your perspective. Um, one of the big challenges we have is market adoption, and it's primarily related to both the seasonality of this uh, particular test. Uh, so you have to go season to season and you're thinking of basically two or three year time horizons, which makes it really challenging to make uh, financial projections. So any insight into market adoption would be really helpful uh, at this point. And um, certainly, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to see questions here too. So, uh, you know, from the questions themselves are extremely valuable feedback to be honest. Uh, because we are learning this uh, industry and this industry is very heterogeneous uh, not just in soil types but also in uh, personalities and and uh, you know farmer cooperative uh, cultures and things like that and so all of those things have to be taken into account uh, when we start thinking about the outreach and the the, uh, the utility of this particular test so I have a question here from Chris Scott. Are there limitations based on the location and region, for example, different soil types or climate? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, that is why we do, that is why I mentioned that the test cannot be interpreted in the naive form. We do need the geospatial uh, coordinates as well as the soil profile uh, for the region in order to make the best predictions. So. Um, California, as I understand, the soils are a little bit more alkaline, so our predictions actually change substantially based on those. Um, Oklahoma, I'm not, I haven't seen uh, soil tests there. I do know that in Arkansas, they use this test for uh, predicting nitrogen recommendations in the rice. It's called the NSTAR test. They don't use our hardware and software, but that's one of the things that we will be trying to reach out to um, for rice. Uh, my guess is that in the southern states, the soils are generally poor in organic matter to begin with, and uh, they generally tend to benefit from more nitrogen, uh, as in uh, contrast with in Illinois and Iowa, where they're extremely rich in organic matter, and they tend to, they don't need so much nitrogen. Um, so who would be the actual user, the farmer or the agronomist? Um, if I'm a producer, can I access do this myself? Probably not. Uh, I think you can, it, typically what we have found is that producers aren't the ones going out and pulling the soil samples from the field. That still remains the most expensive piece in this whole uh, process. However, that gets amortized over a number of different tests. We have designed the test in order to be compatible with a soil testing lab. So we've been working with the largest soil testing labs in the US and they expect throughputs of about a quarter of a million samples per year. And that's kind of our target right now. Uh, if a farmer wanted to do this kind of test, uh, they might be able to pull a couple samples uh, with the and, and try them with the SLAN test. They can buy that off uh, directly. Um, but really, the purpose of this test is to feed into that precision agriculture machine uh, and and be able to do a high grade, high high spatial resolution sampling, about two acre samples, uh, two acre grid samples that then are used for precision agriculture. Um, so can you briefly talk me through the use again from the need of the test to getting results? Um, okay, I can take this very briefly. So the need is, um, we believe at least in Illinois and Iowa, uh, farmers tend to use more nitrogen than is called for and it ends up in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and causes hypoxia. So this is a test that allows them to offset their nitrogen needs based on determining how much nitrogen is actually uh, uh, produced in the soil by, by uh, metabolizing the organic matter itself. So the test uh, is a soil test. If you take a soil sample and you incubate it and you get a reading off of that and you uh, then use that to calculate how much nitrogen is going to become available. 
uh, the whole process is running off of uh, the hardware and the software that we have developed. Uh, so how is this different from Adaptin? So Adaptin is actually a computational tool only. So Adaptin, uh, you can put in organic matter numbers and it will try and calculate uh, mineralization. Um, they have variable results. They're actually much better performant on the East Coast, as I've heard, because uh, East Coast tend, uh, soils tend to be more manure rich. And I think some of the, just by history of how that model was developed, um, uh, Adaptin is better tuned to manured soils. Uh, in Champaign County, we don't tend to have too many of those around here. Um, how many samples are required for accurate recommendations? Um, so typically, the, uh, philosophies differ. In Illinois, um, people actually tend to go by management zones so they, so because they tend to trust the soil survey results to a greater extent. So, uh, so they go by essentially, it, in both cases, it tends to work out to about two and a half acres to a sample. So um, where you don't trust your soil survey results too much, you uh, are probably better off doing graded samples at uh, two and a half acre grids. Uh, can you share the PDF of the slides? I believe a version of this presentation will be on, um, uh, on YouTube. And I, uh, but if you, if you want, please send me an email and I, and I can see what we can uh, provide. Uh, does this help provide any data for the amount of nitrogen leaching through the soil profile as opposed to crop uptake? Yes, in fact, it has been built. The model has been built upon how much nitrogen is uh, taken up from the soil itself. So we actually have uh, N15 data uh, where we can use radio labeled fertilizer and we can estimate how much of that fertilizer ended up in the crop and how much, what was the balance that came from the soil. So we can actually estimate how much is coming from the soil. The balance is actually leaching out. Um, and you can see extension also produces a number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, papers that suggest that even if you don't apply any nitrogen, you might actually in some cases see as much as 100 pounds equivalent running off uh, or leaching through the soil profile. Um, what kind of objections have you got from the fertilizer industry and extension with this tech? Lots of them. <laughs> um, uh, actually, so so we haven't really gotten any um, direct opposition from the fertilizer industry per se, and the reason is that my my guess is that the uh, or okay I should say one thing. So one of the uh, one of our clients actually is a uh, large co-op, so they are also selling fertilizer. So they see the value in um, in creating a better nitrogen management program for their customers. Now, if a fertilizer dealer uh, is going to be able to, uh, the way I understand the economics of the fertilizer dealership is also that they, if they actually provided this test to their clients through a soil testing lab directly, um, they would make more money on the whole uh, and, and come well ahead of the losses that they would incur from uh, losses in sales. Because even though they are losing $35, they're probably losing a much smaller amount in commissions. Um, and, and so they can actually make that up based uh, on providing prescriptions for their customer instead. What kind of impact might this have on runoff? This is something that we are extremely interested in seeing. Uh, there was a paper last year that said that, you know, uh, because of an unseasonably wet fall, many farmers were not able to put down fall nitrogen in a couple of river basin areas in Illinois. And that actually resulted in like something like 30 or 40 percent reductions in runoff. So we are actually um, extremely hopeful that we can turn around this uh, nitrogen runoff story very quickly, uh, as quickly as the adoption um, you know, as, as quickly as the adoption can be driven up. Uh, what about sustainable practices like cover crops? Very, very good, good question. Uh, we had um, a, a leading cover crops person uh, visit us and uh, in the, this long story short, um, cover crops are, are uh, uh, they do require a slightly different adjustment in our model. We're not using um, uh, we don't have enough data on cover crops yet. So what we think from, from the little data that we have seen in the first two or three years, 
um, cover crops tend to actually increase fertilizer needs somewhat. And then there is a uh, equilibration of sorts. And after that, you tend to start seeing the benefits of cover crops. So the cover crop carbon content and uh, the organic matter content from cover crops tends to become established and and uh, organic matter levels tend to rise over a three to five year period. And after that, this organic matter becomes a fodder for mineralizable nitrogen uh, coming in. So there is a transition period um, where you do have to be extremely careful if you're, if you're going with cover crops. But then after about five or six years, you'll start seeing the benefits in reduced nitrogen. Cover crops also have the other um, advantage that they can actually increase the permeation uh, the, the permeability of the soil. So now you've got uh, more water than you previously had. Uh, and actually that can drive up the demand for nitrogen, but on the whole, you can actually make more yield uh, because of cover crop in that fashion. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a simple answer, I know, but um, I guess there are, there are several scenarios that, that could result from things like cover crops or uh, no-till or even strip till or those kinds of practices. Um, do you have permission provisions for government agencies obtaining this program? Yes, in fact, we have spoken to the national program staff in uh, uh, in Rockville. Um, I'm sorry, in Beltsville, and uh, they put us in touch with uh, their Colorado Experimental Station. This is USDA. Um, they put us in touch with their Colorado Experimental Station, and they've told us that as soon as the product's on the shelf, please let us know. Uh, I haven't gone back yet because our product is technically not on the shelf yet. Um, however, we did try to reach out to NRCS. Uh, we've uh, noted that many of the NRCS uh, leadership, uh, the leaders at NRCS have, um, have, have actually joined the soil health uh, partnership, uh, soil health initiative program. Um, and there are a couple different of these private organizations that are uh, becoming uh, sort of an important player in this field. There's a soil health initiative out of Oklahoma, and there's a soil health partnership, which I believe is uh, supported by the National Corn Growers Association. So those are the the outlets that we will be reaching out to. Um, one of our advisors actually used to be the ex president at uh, National Corn Growers Association, uh, and so we we believe we are in a good place to um, to go out and and, and sort of. Uh, leverage those resources. Uh, what are your thoughts of year-round cover to maintain an active microbial population? Uh, this is a very geography specific question. Uh, in a slightly warmer climate, a year-round cover has sometimes some un unintended consequences. Um, uh, I, I couldn't tell you that. I, I, if I, I've asked my customers what they think about year-round cover and they're sort of ambivalent in both cases. Um, there is a certain trend, of course, towards maintaining a year-round cover, um, mostly uh, sort of from a soil conservation kind of uh, perspective. Um, I don't believe that microbes care one way or the other. Uh, if you don't provide them with the right uh, environment, they just go dormant. And as soon as the environment comes back, uh, they become active and they're, they're just fine. So I don't know that it actually affects the microbes too much. Um, of course, there are things, uh, there are certain things that do matter. One of them is pH. Uh, and if it would be an interesting question to see if year-round cover can actually uh, prevent a soil from getting too, uh, too acidic or too alkaline. And I don't know that question. I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. But that's a good question. I'll try and keep that in mind. Um, the thing that affects microbes most is the soil pH. And that's often a most uh, that's often a very neglected uh, soil health parameter uh, in many cases, at, at least in in sort of the conventional and hydrous ammonia uh, application regime. Okay, well, it looks yeah, like a lot uh, of good questions. yeah, a lot of good questions. Um, so, uh, cost of in wrapping up, any uh, any parting thoughts? Um, well, send me an email, I guess. <laughs> uh, we're very excited about this. We're, uh, you know, eagerly waiting the results of our phase two application. And uh, of course, that would mean a lot to soil diagnostics and, and the product moving forward. But even if it doesn't, I think we are, we'll just be slowed down a little bit. But I think we're still in a place where we can uh, put this product out there over the next couple of years. Um, 
we've been uh, we've been bashful to some extent we don't want to just sort of uh, make a blitzkrieg of announcements or something like that because uh, it, it is sensitive people have a lot of questions there's a lot of flux in the industry right now um, a lot of competing tools uh, even seed corn seed producers are now pulling, uh, send uh, you know shipping their own nitrogen recommendation tools so there's a lot of uh, um, uh, there are a lot of options out there for growers and so um, uh, you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm we're being very careful before releasing this um, uh, Seth you mentioned uh, applicability in California in fact uh, one of our partners did uh, talk to some people in California uh, we have been interested in uh, expanding our reach to non uh, grain crops, non-commodity crops. So I, I, uh, I have been told, and I'm no expert in by any means, but I have been told that uh, uh, sugar beets and strawberries are extremely sensitive to nitrogen levels, too much nitrogen, and they turn watery tasting. So there's a quality issue also, also which we are very, very interested in. Um, and so if you think, what well, the 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 um, we have an active lab here at University of Illinois. So if you think we can be of help, uh, please, you know, we we're very happy to look at it as a primary scientific question as well and certainly the equipment to uh, do the tests already exists so if you think you have the ability to um, generate nitrogen trial data for any crop of your choice uh, we can work with you to see if this kind of product would mean um, uh, would be valuable to um, to your your uh, clients Okay, well, thank you for that. So I have uh, popped up uh, uh, the, the poll questions, and I've added uh, one more. So um, we're basically trying to get your feedback on innovation diffusion, which is not directly related to this webinar, but is uh, uh, kind of a function of what we're trying to do. So um, with that, I want to say uh, thank you again to our uh, presenter, Kostab. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. It was really informative. Uh, again, for those of you in the audience, if you would like to get a copy of the, uh, the presentation itself, it will be posted to our YouTube page, so you can scroll up and get the uh, YouTube address. And uh, with that, we will uh, wrap up this webinar. Thanks again. Thank you.